What is up My Little Pony fans, Simon here, welcome to Hannah Talk, and today I'm here with a very special guest. Now she is an actress who is best known to fans as Spike from My Little Pony, but she's also played across a variety of other series such as Death Note, Cyber Six, Dragon Ball Z, Mobile Suit Gundam, Ranma Half, and many, many more. Please welcome Kathy Westlark. Hi everyone, hi Simon, great to be here. Great to be here with you as well, how are you? Well, considering we're all hunkering down here uh, during COVID-19 time, I'm, I'm doing well, thank you. But I know for so many, it's uh, it's been quite a challenge. I, I can definitely agree, agree on that. And that's it's, it's definitely very hard at the moment. And one thing I've been wanting to ask about is that during, obviously, this time with the pandemic that's going on at the moment, especially with uh, because of what's happening with, like, productions, like, put to a grinding halt, how have you been keeping things up, especially on the voice acting and animation side of things? Right. Well, um, definitely there has been adjustment, which I think, of course, there has been with every industry and every job. And, and so in our case, um, really, I think what what's tricky is that uh, at this point before this all occurred, um, things had changed significantly over the last many, many years in the way of voiceover auditioning and recording anyway. In other words, when I started many, many, many moons ago, uh, we would uh, go into the studio for every audition. So it was very hands-on, very face-to-face. -face. And then time went by, technology came into place, and now quite traditionally, we actually will um, record our own auditions at our home and send them to our agents, or if we don't have one, if we didn't have one, directly to the client. So, so now, um, of course, with uh, COVID-19 um, and social distancing, um, people still go into studios, but it depends on what the project is. So for animation series or episodics, uh, where we usually get together with five to eight people, an engineer, uh, the director, casting director that is, and even the client could be there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, that's a scenario where we're usually in the studio with those people. Mm. So um, that, I haven't done another episode in a little while, but... I know that people are starting to work on trying to uh, adjust their home studios so that they can really work, uh, you know, from home and have the lines all connect and link into the studio. So for myself, I, I did a, I'm just thinking of the most recent ones. I went in for a commercial, but there was myself, the engineer on the other side of the glass and the clients online. So, and the same with a video or a, a video game that, um, video game work the same sort of things that there's one actor and then the clients in the booth but sitting at a social distance so yeah it's tricky and um certainly a lot of productions have had to shut down as well for especially on camera stuff that's definitely definitely true and i i definitely see that happening with um i mean even just in the last few weeks where I've interviewed a multitude of different actors over the last, uh, over just this last week, actually, and even from a couple of weeks ago, from, I think it was when Spike Spencer, who many fans will know from Evangelion as Shinji, was, is actually now still in Australia, after having mm -hmm. been to Australia with Tiffany Grant and Amanda Wynne Lee, because of the pandemic that's going on at the moment. So he spoke a little bit about that, you know, luckily we have... Um, vocal studios in Australia that he can use for projects but for the most part a lot of actors now are starting to record this stuff from home as you said and especially yep. well before this pandemic had, had taken place yeah well it's it's basically um, uh, you know everybody really is auditioning from home now and having been a casting director and director a long time ago and having you know literally taught workshops and, and, and uh, voice private, co private coaching sessions for such a long time, many, many years. Um, one thing that's frustrating for me uh, watching new people come in is that they just don't have a director there uh, to do the audition. And that's very, very difficult for people who are new um, mm. because we used to go into the studio and it would be like a mini workshop doing an audition with someone directly. So, yeah, that's a little bit of a, uh, a challenge for some new people coming in. So. Absolutely. It's different now. Absolutely. That's definitely true. Now, going into talking about with, uh, it was speaking about, of course, with your beginning, how did you get started in uh, acting? Well, um, I don't know if a lot of uh, fans are aware of it, but I also did a little stint with on camera acting as well as voice acting. So 
Um, how I got into uh, both of those was when I was working uh, as an associate producer with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, so that would be like CBC to us, CBS to you, NBC to you. Um, but um, I was working in the radio music department as an associate producer programming classical music uh, and other music, but uh, primarily classical and, and, and interspersed with popular and instrumental music. And so um, there was another group of people in the drama department who on the side said, hey, let's um, put our wares together and let's, uh, let's see if we can do produce a little you know, mini, a mini uh, on-camera film. So I thought, this is going to be great. Let's just do it for fun. So I got involved that way. And then I thought, you kind of like this, and it's kind of fun. And then the next thing you know, um, I met other producers at CBC. And um, one of the people who, now this is Voice, who worked on the show that I worked on, the host of the show, uh, Jurgen Goff, said, you have a really great voice. Have you ever thought of doing voiceover? And I said, voice what? <laughs> Come again? <laughs> It's like voiceover, you know, like commercials and information. I'm like, nope, never. <laughs> so he said, I'd be happy to put together a demo for you and uh, give it a go. And I said, okay, sure, we'll see. And that's that's how it all began. Wow, fantastic! That's absolutely yeah. wonderful, right there. And who would you consider? And who or what inspired you to go into acting? And who would you consider to be your your influences? Well, um, I really do have to say that the main person was this man who was the host of our show. His name was uh, Jurgen Gott. Uh, he passed away uh, a few years ago now. I can't even recall how many years, perhaps seven years ago or so. And um, he inspired me because uh, he was an entrepreneur, but he was the host of our radio show, which was live to air. And um, Jurgen Gott is his name. And... I always was fascinated about how he made a living from many different things that he did. So not only was he the host of our show, which was called Disc Drive, um, but he also was really interested in, in wine. And so he would travel to different parts of the world and he would do commentaries and he, and he did critiquing on that and, and articles. And, and it always amazed me all the things he could do and make a living at more than one thing. So that kind of fascinated me. And I thought, well, I'll try this voiceover stuff and we'll see. And I still like, you know, producing, so we'll see. And so I'd say he's my, he was definitely uh, my, my main mentor in this whole thing. Fantastic. That's absolutely yeah. wonderful right there. Now with every kind of project that you've worked on, whether it's been live action or in the world of animation, do you walk into a series or a project uh, expecting to play like a, a hoping to get like a certain role or is it just like a jack in the box, not knowing what to expect? Well, it's a good question, actually. I mean, uh, because my mainstay is voiceover now, uh, I'm still in the market for on camera, but I just seem to be the, you know, voiceover is my thing. Um, it's really after you become, you've done this for years and years and years, you become a seasoned actor, then you're very, very clear on, on what your range is and where you would fit in the spectrum of possibilities for auditioning. So um, I do know that now, where my range is, but at the same time, it's always great when you come across a casting director who wants to hear beyond what you've been doing, you know, primarily over and over again. So you do get sometimes slotted into different groups because there is only so much time for auditions. But um, when I started out, I was a cartoony actor. Uh, so I did a lot more of this stuff and I talked like that and it's like, you know, talking like that, hey. <laughs> and uh, larger characters, you know, like, well, you know, I... I used to work down at the fish market, and uh, when I was down there, I picked up a couple of trout, you know. So I did all these other crazy things, and now I'm doing more than boy voices. I'm doing moms and things. I'm doing some action heroines. Um, so I do know where I would fit in and where I would more than likely not get work. And that is because you have to accept that you have a voice print. And so if something sounds strained in, audi in an audition, it's unlikely you'll be cast for that because they'll just pick someone who has a naturally strained sounding voice. Right. So that comes with time. That comes with time. And it's the same thing. So your, your demo tape, your demo uh, MP3 for voiceover uh, has to really demonstrate a variety of things that you do so that the casting people who don't know you off the bat will, will hear that. But the same thing occurs for on camera, but in that case, you need an eight by 10 photo to sort of capture the different um, 
characters that you would play on camera. So it's similar in a, in a different way. Right. It's up to you to really nail that if you're not known yet in in the in the business. Right. Fantastic. Now with now with as you mentioned about of course before with having worked across from on camera work to voiceover, have you ever turned down a role for any particular reason? Well, I have to, when, when you ask that, I, I can think right away <laughs> of a, a looping job that I did. So for those of the who don't know what looping is, back in the day, I did quite a bit of looping as well, uh, which is um, lip syncing to a, a film. Uh, so you're seeing the film or the TV episodic in front of you, and you have a big microphone that you stand in front of. If you're doing it singly, if you're only voicing yourself, uh, you could you could do it that way, or you're also voicing with another person who's sharing your microphone if it's a crowd scene, and you get three beeps in your headset, beep, 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 and then you jump in. So we know that to be what we also call ADR, uh, which is Animated Dialogue Replacement or Audio Digital Reproduction. And I remember going in and being told very vaguely what the uh, show was about and finding myself doing some pretty racy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> From a vocal perspective, so wow. uh, it's all passable, don't worry, but, but uh, I thought, oh, okay, I would like to kind of know what I'd be getting into next time, uh, right. so that was kind of one thing that I thought, yeah, I told my agent, you know, there's a limit to that, so just let me know what you know before I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. And I can remember one other thing, I won't get into it in, d in detail for time reasons, but uh, what I was doing on camera also back in the day, um, we did a wonderful um, improvisational job, which was really helpful to the young police cadets who were in training to become policemen and police women, and also the corrections officers. And so there was a scenario where we were hired as actors in groups um, to act, to reenact uh, actual life experiences that these police would come across in their on their beat when they actually would get work, like when they graduated. And sort of things like uh, drug bust and um, uh, drunk driver and husband-wife dispute and all these things that we would do. And I remember one time, um, this was for the corrections officers who have to deal with more severe situations. And they asked me if I would be part of a uh, hostage-taking uh, thing. So <laughs> wow, uh, it's all directed by the instructors themselves. But it was pretty intense, I have to say. And for some reason, they chose me to be the lead person in, in this scenario. But it was wonderful training for them. Um, but I have to say it was pretty, pretty intense. And we were directed to, you know, to do whatever we had to do to train them. Right. And I think it's excellent training, but it was, it's pretty intense stuff. I can imagine so it those is. So kinds of things that I would, yeah, check before <laughs> I probably said yes to again. Fantastic. Now, we spoke a little bit about that, like, uh, you said that your first voiceover role was in, uh, was being the host of this, uh, this, this TV show that your mentor got for you. What, and what was the experience, uh, like, uh, working on that role? Well, actually, he didn't get me the role. He actually just told me that I had a great voice and made a, the demo for me. Right. So, it was up to me to then get an agent, but that, again, was through the CBC and the drama department. There were two wonderful drama producers, John Giuliani and Don Kowalczyk. Love them to bits. They both passed away. Um, wonderfully talented and great people to work with. And so um, they told me about the talent agents in the city at the time and who they recommended because they knew they knew them well and they thought they were excellent. So that's how I actually ended up getting my first agent. And through that talent agent, uh, I got my first, my first voice work. And that would be... Um, uh, oh gosh, it's a long time ago. There were these uh, equipment company, equipment company that was called Bendorf Burster, almost like a, you know, any technology company now, I guess, uh, like Canon or those kinds of companies. And so I would do uh, radio commercials for that. Right. So that was my first voicing job. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Now going across into the animation world, your best known fans as Spike from the My Little Pony series. What was it like to step into the world of My Little Pony? Um, it was, as I mean, looking back, I'm so grateful for that experience, so grateful for that experience. But when the audition came about, it was really the same thing that we do no matter what auditions that come in. It was, you know, what we do. Every time we go in, we get another project and another project and another project. And while we all commit to them and enjoy being a part of it, there is absolutely no way we would know what would turn into a legendary experience. So 
Um, so Spike was um, one of many of the characters I tried out for. I tried out for Princess Celestia. Uh, I tried out for actually probably all of them, maybe not Pinky just because of the voice range, um, but certainly the others. Uh, um, yeah, and, uh, and of course Spike because I do the boy voices. So yeah, so it was just another day in the studio as an actor until we, <laughs> until this thing started to get cooking. That's, that's fantastic. Now my, now, my Little Pony has been a franchise that has gone as far back as the 1980s and still going really, really strong. So my question to you is, we've, all, we've obviously heard about some of the latest My Little Pony projects that, that have been happening in the last couple of years. Do you think there's more story to be told with My Little Pony down the line? Well, uh, I'm not sure if you know, Simon, that the series actually has ended. Oh. So... I'm not sure if you were aware of that, but mm. it did it, it did end. So um, there are no future episodes coming that we are aware of, and I'm assuming that it's over. Um, so as far as it as a legacy continues, there's no way of us knowing whether somebody down the road would want to revamp something or try something. But it seems to be pretty final the way that it was ended, in our opinion. Um, and but I have to say that that the whole mothership of my little pony friendship is magic has left so many people affected and touched in a beautiful way and it changed lives it changed lives and i mean it was a series that had sociologists um studying it all wow. over the world because of the healing aspects that it had the effect it had on people bringing people together who never in a in a million years would think that they would um be drawn to wanting to make friendships and um being able to expand in their own personalities and their own lives and reach out. Absolutely. And even to speak with others on issues. So it's, it's, um, it does continue for sure in everyone's hearts and, and certainly in mine too. Absolutely. And you never know, there will, there will probably be more story to be told with the franchise going forward, whether it's a brand new series or a film, you just never know. Well, it's left to be seen, that's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, going across into the anime world, you've also played Nia from the anime series Death Note. What was it like playing that character and in a series like Death Note? I have to say that Nia was one of my favorite characters. And I think because it was just so interesting for me to play that character. Of course, he's, again, another boy in this case. But the it was one of those series that I thought was beautifully interestingly written and mysterious and had a lot of subplots and my character was was so intense and yet uh in order to make him realistic in order to get into the character there was a strange a combination of him being still a child and yet being a genius and so it was a really fun and interesting role for me to play from that perspective Fantastic. Yeah. That's absolutely wonderful right there. Yeah. Now, as many people know on Death Note, there was the live action movie that was based on the anime, which had Willem Dafoe in the, in, uh, as one of the main characters from the series. Did you ever see the film yourself? And what has been your opinion on anime being adapted for live action? Well, I haven't, I haven't and hadn't seen that movie. No, I haven't seen that. So it may be something I'll check out one of these days. Um, I think it's wonderful that they, they bring it to the big screen. I mean, certainly we did so for My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. We did the My Little Pony movie. Um, and for me as an actor, that was a wonderful experience being on the red carpet, so to speak, in Lincoln Center, New York City with uh, some of the film stars. Um, so I think it's wonderful that, that each project um, can, can reach that level and, and get to a wider audience. And it always just looks so wonderful on the screen, especially I can imagine, having not seen it though, I can imagine that the coloration of uh, uh, the cinematography with Death Note would have been just amazing. So, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I might have to check it out. Fantastic. Now, uh, various other series and roles you've also played in was Cyber Six, Dragon Ball Z, Ra Ramna Half, and Mobile Suit Gundam. What was it like playing across uh, those variety of shows? Well, they're all so unique. I mean, Ranma One Half was truly the first big anime that I had ever done. I had done little bits and pieces of ADR for other countries. And then anime with its sheer volume of shows that came our way kind of took over the scene. So, um, but Ranga One Half with, with Shampoo 
So I'm going to do it. I don't hope I hope I don't blow up this microphone here, but <laughs> <laughs> shampoo everybody who knows her and loves her. Hi, yeah, Rama. Rama takes shampoo to date. Oh, I don't like Akane. Akane not as pretty as I am. <laughs> you know, so uh, I'm all, I'm always you know ready and able to get going on the next round. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I say the same thing for Cyber Six, which actually ended. Uh, after 13 episodes, and it was ended uh, in such a way where we, we did think it would continue or could continue, and it was left as a kind of a hanger, um, but it never did, and uh, it's now on DVD, which is wonderful, and honestly, oh, I would be so raring to go for another 13 episodes. I know the fans loved Cyber 6, too, and that was a wonderful show for me to perform also because it was one of the first um, series that I had done where the woman was the lead. Wow. And not only was it just because the woman was the lead, so we, we had an opportunity as, 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 a, as a woman to be able to, to do that, but uh, I did play two roles. I played Adrian, which was her in disguise as a male teacher, um, as well as her the lead. And the other thing about that series, which was incredible, was that, again, there was a lot of depth to that uh, particular series. And I love the coloration of that one, too. There were oranges and blues, and the cinematography was very different in those days. We hadn't had all the digital technology that we had have that we have now but for that time it was um almost a bit cutting edge Fantastic. and then shot in a kind of a european setting so it was a really interesting show yeah i really enjoyed it on a lot of lot of levels Fantastic. That's absolutely wonderful right there. Now, speaking about, of course, on uh, on Dragon Ball, did you ever meet, like, any of the actors from the Funimation version, or did you ever watch the Funimation version of the series? There have been so many Dragon Ball uh, shows <laughs> that it starts to boggle my mind, uh, which, you know, because I, I was in a few of them, but basically the ones that we worked on were all the Canadian actors um, of those particular seasons. So uh, Funimation came up and Funimation's um, producer would come up as well during that time. So they were there with us doing this. And I honestly can't remember who the director would have been at that time. There's been so many shows. But um, I do know the producers were up there with us doing that during the time frame. So the actors were, were always Canadian, the Canadian actors of that version, of those of that, that dubbed version. But it was really fun. Um, I did play uh, Chiao Tzu as well, um, and a few other characters, more incidental characters. But of course, Young Trunks was another one I played. Um, so it was it was a lot of fun. But uh, I tell you, that's one of those characters, Young Trunks, where I was just like yelling and screaming the entire time. That's one thing about <laughs> Dragon Ball. You gotta take your Wheaties, you know? <laughs> Being a cereal, by the way. <laughs> uh, an energy cereal back in my day. Oh, I'm dating myself. Um, but it was really fun, yeah. I mean, that was it took a lot of energy to do that show, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fighting in, in midair. <laughs> Absolutely. That's that's just fantastic. Now, you also stepped into the comic book universe from X-Men Evolution to Iron Man Armored Adventures. Now, this is kind of a three-part question here. Is What was it like to step into that world? And were you familiar with the, the comic book universe before going into those roles? And are there any particular um, comic book characters that you want to see brought to the live-action world? Um, firstly, uh, well, not particularly because I wasn't too involved or aware of the comic book world before doing uh, some of those things. So no, it's not familiar to me, so it's hard for me to pretty much comment on that. But I mean, I can certainly say that anything that comes up out of those worlds, I'm so happy to do, just as I would any role. Um, but they were unique, like others have been. And then, of course, it was fun to see all the comic books come out of My Little Pony by the various um, artists as well. So, you know, Tony Fleeks and uh, some of the other ones, they were, you know, they do a lot of that work as well. So um, I would say that those were the ones that I was interested in because there just seemed to be so much of them. And every convention we would go to, um, we would meet the comic book artists. So that Fantastic. was kind of a treat as well. Fantastic. Uh, and I have been to some anime conventions as well. In, in, in you know, so we, so we would meet some of those, uh, the anime comic artists too. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a fascinating world and it's a wonderful branch of, of it all. So... Absolutely. Yeah, I probably should uh, should get 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 to checking in on that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Now, where do you hope to see yourself with regards to acting in the in the long run? Uh, well, I don't. You know, it's funny that you say that because you know, it's it, there is no particular goal per se. Because I feel after all the 
literally thousands of characters I've played. Um, you know, there isn't one that I aspire to, but I am always grateful and, and happy to do whatever roles come my way. But it's always interesting to see uh, what new shows are coming out, which uh, roles we'll be playing, and um, you know how that will challenge us as an actor. So some of the ones that are very in-depth, um, that are more dramatic, um, are interesting, but they're very different from the ones that are very crazy, cartoony, playful, and fun, um, or ones that may be pertaining to children. So there's a real, real range, and I'm always excited to know what's next. Fantastic. <laughs> Now we're, now, we're going to be skipping through a couple of other questions, obviously for time limit here, but um, without going into spoilers, what's next for Kathy Westlock for the fans to, to know about? Well, we can't go into the spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> so I really, uh, I really can't say. I'll tell you that I have done a few promos for things, uh, so we'll see what comes of those. Um, I just had a, so, so you have to understand too, that we do the gamut. Well, certainly I do. So not only am I doing animation projects, but I'm also doing narrative projects and I'm also doing, uh, commercials. I just had a commercial on the air, uh, this past week, um, that actually was, uh, reflective of the COVID-19 campaign. So, um, we are very, I'm not sure if you guys have heard it in Australia or if you do it. But in Canada, especially where I live in the province of British Columbia, at 7 o'clock every night, and, and all the communities seem to be doing it, or many of them are, my community certainly is, we, we bang pots and pans in honor of the care workers and service workers who wow. are on the front lines. Um, and so, yeah, I just did a commercial for the BC Hospital Employees Union uh, acknowledging that, actually, that very thing. So... Um, there's also video games, you know, there's the whole, the whole gamut of voiceover work is what I do do. And so we'll see because uh, some of them are still cooking. Fantastic. So we need to see what comes of that. But uh, if I gave you a spoiler, I would have to call in the moose. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> some of the fans will know what that means. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that's no problem at all. That's fantastic. And final question, uh, last question. What do you think Spike would say if he was in Australia? Um, yeah, Spike, yeah, well, you know, I've been kind of busy in America doing the stuff I do, but, um, I'd probably say, good eye, Mike, whatever, that's right, yeah. <laughs> that's what I'd say. Right, yeah. Good eye. That's fantastic. That's absolutely Don't wonderful. Me. <laughs> <laughs> that's I'm absolutely fantastic. I'm a little rusty, but I'll tell you, we do do accents, and I have done the Aussie accent before. That's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> That's absolutely wonderful right there. Kathy oh. Westlock, thank you so much. It's been an absolute honor. A pleasure for me too, Simon. And I have to say, hey, kudos to you. I did a sneak peek on your compositions and you are awesome. Oh, thank you so much. You that... are absolutely awesome. I have to tell you, I have a Bachelor of Music degree and a minor in Soch, and I also was a you know associate producer of music, so I know music. I worked at the CBC, and I used to edit music as well. So your work is fantastic, so I have no problem plugging you right now. Everybody, Simon. Thank you so much, <laughs> Kathy. That is absolutely wonderful right there. And is there anything you would like to say uh, to the fans out there in Australia and in the world? I want to tell the Australian fans that I love you guys to bits. And I do hope one day to be able to finally, 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 all systems go, everybody's healthy, make it out there and uh, give you a big hug in person. So thank you for all of your support. Um, it's wonderful follow, you know, having you follow me on Twitter, everybody, and just being able to, um, some of you have actually come to the conventions that I've met in person. That's been a real treat for me too. So I just want to say the thank you to everybody, to the entire world, to, to stay safe, take care. And I want to say that um, we have in Canada pretty strict rules about washing our hands and uh, staying two meters apart and doing all those things, and, and we're, we're starting to come out of this pretty well. So I really do support those rules. But I love you guys so much, and I hope that we'll be able to meet up with more of you in the years to come. Hopefully there'll be more conventions absolutely in the future. Absolutely. That is fantastic right there. Well, guys... Yeah. Well, guys, if you'd like to find out more about Kathy Westlife, you can check out the links, which I'll put to in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe to Hammer Talk, follow me on Facebook and Twitter, and all the other stuff that will be up there once this interview is posted up. Thank you all so much for listening. This is Simon. 
and Kathy Westlock signing off. Bye for now. Signing off.